So I will, uh, I'll just start by introducing our first speaker, who is Libby Henson from Grassroots PR. So Libby's been involved in breeding livestock since she was a youngster. She's director of Grassroots PR. She's involved in the British Alpaca Society and all sorts of other things to do with livestock breeding and conservation. Uh, and her talk today is titled The Importance of Pedigree in Livestock Breeding. Good morning, everybody. I'm not going to use the, 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 um, this. I'm just going to speak. So if you can't hear me, do, do, do shout out. Um, OK, let's get started. OK, so to, I'm going to talk today a, a little bit of an introduction, really, to the, to the concept of livestock breeding and cons rare breed conservation. And that story begins right back in the, in the mists of time. And Andrew used to, I've, I've, I've known Andrew all my life, ever since I was a small child. And we, he, used to, he and my dad used to tell us stories about rare breed conservation and breeds right well, from when we were very young. And of course, one of the earliest stories, one of the earliest recorded stories of livestock breeding goes right back to the Bible, where um, it, the, the Bible tells us that Laban, that Jacob went to work for Laban in order to win the hand of his daughter in marriage. And he was told that after seven years, he could marry the daughter, and in payment, he'd be allowed to keep any spotted sheep in the flock. And so it says in the Bible that, that um, Laban peeled the sticks and put spotted sticks around the water holes so that the sheep would see spots and have spotted lambs, very Lamarckian. <laughs> Luckily, God also sent him a dream in which he told him to only allow spotted rams to jump the ewes, which was rather better advice. And so at the end of, in fact, 14 years, he left and took almost all of Laban's flock with him, because in that 14 years, he'd bred an entirely spotted flock. The way that livestock breeding works is the first thing we have to do is lift the natural selection pressures that control how a population will be. So we have to control the winter food supply, the weather conditions, control predation, and as time went on, be able to control disease. And so if you lift natural selection pressures, that means more individuals survive, and it enables you to start to impose your own, your own selection pressures. And those can be whatever you like. And throughout history, people have selected livestock, breed, livestock species in different directions. So for growth rate, body size, body shape, fecundity, more, more pr productivity, or even just for appearance, for color, for horns, for feather colors and patterns, for behavior, so that animals will do things we want them to do, for fiber quality, milk production, all the different things that we've developed our breeds for over the centuries. So we've been able to take primitive populations De designed and evolved by, by natural selection, and by lifting those natural selection pressures and imposing our own, we're able to produce populations with extremely high productivity in whatever area we're interested in. So these are Soe sheep on Herta, the most primitive breed of sheep still being controlled by natural selection, right through to the Texel, one of the biggest meat-producing breeds in the country, and my beloved Cotswolds, one of the great wool-producing breeds in the country. From the very large to the very small, from the hard working to the high stepping, from wild red jungle fowl to the high production hybrids which constitute the modern um, <coughs> poultry production systems all over the world. And along the way, people have also created things which are attractive or interesting for, for other ideas. So all the ornamental and specialist breeds, of which Andrew was so very fond. Um, and again, as a child, I can remember going to Cobthorne and him taking us around the pens and showing us, you know, the last three Scots dumpies or the, all these different little breeds that, that he was so passionately interested in. So livestock breeding has basically been a long history of looking over the fence. And it goes right back to Robert Bakewell in this country, who was renowned for not just selecting the best animals in his own flocks and herds, but inventing, really, progeny testing. Because what he did was he rented out his rams to all the neighboring farmers, and then he rode around on his horse in the spring, looking over the fence and seeing which farmer had got the best crops of lambs. And then he would go back to that farmer and have that ram back 
to use in his own flock. So he was using all the neighbouring farms to, prog to progeny test his rams so that he could then bring those rams back and use them in his, in his own flocks. And he did more to in improve the Longhorn and the, and the Dishley Leicester than anybody else had ever done in any breed in a short space of time. But those ideas were then picked up by other gentlemen farmers in the UK and breed societies were formed, associations of farmers who had one particular type or breed of animals and they began to, to gather the information about those populations and publish them in herd books. So the Coates herd book was the first published in 1822 but throughout the 18, 1800s and the early 1900s pretty much every breed society formed an association and began to collect pedigree information so that they could use that to inc imp increase production and improve their breeds. So in the modern day, pedigree registration remains exactly the same. We've got farmers out there breeding their animals and we're encouraging them to provide that information to a breed society or a breed registry so that that information can be used initially for breed production purposes, but also it can be used for other things. So in terms of breed improvement, and I'm sure Rex and others will talk about this later, you can take a highly productive strain or breed, you can find out as much information, measure and, and uh, quantify what's going on, and then by using the pedigrees and the degree of relationship between animals, you can in enhance the, the rate at which you can increase production. I'm far more interested and have always been far more interested in how you use that information not just to increase production but to conserve the populations that we already have in order to keep all our options open for the future. So you can use pedigree information for breed conservation, to monitor, monitor genetic change, for marketing breeding stock and to monitor and control disease. So these days, in terms of modern registries, I, I, my company, we, we work with 120 different pedigree breed societies, monitoring all of those breeds all the time. We're keeping full pedigree records, which enables us to look at progeny and descendant analysis. We know who the breeders are. We can look at geographical locations. We can identify animals. We can do performance recording and relationships within populations. And of course, increasingly, we can use the most, more, much more modern technologies using DNA parentage checking, DNA disease tracking, um, actually looking for, for functional DNAs, uh, bits of DNA genes within populations, linked to weight recording, linear assessment, show sales, and so on. And all of that now we can make available directly to the farmers. So for the last 150 years, farmers have been sending their information in good faith to their breed society who put it into a, into a herd book and publish it, often a year or two years later, and send it out. And then the only way you can use those herd books to do anything useful is you've got to have a full set, because each generation is only in one book. So you need a full set of herd books and a very large dining room table and lots of patience to be able to lay everything out and track things and work out what's happening. In the last 20 years, with the introduction of... of computerization into all of this, we can now do all of those things at the press of a button, and the farmers can do it online. So all of our farmers can now access all of that pedigree information and what's going on within the populations directly online at any time they like. So this is a, an extended pedigree, anything in blue is a link, you can go and look at an animal, look at its descendants, look at its offspring, and, and in some breeds look at its production characteristics as well. Um, it also enables farmers to be able to interact directly with the registry online so they can keep their own records up to date. And by seeing it online, it makes people much more likely to do that. So they can notify births and apply for registrations. They can transfer ownership of animals. They can apply for DNA testing. They can record deaths with post-mortem information so we can track what's happening. If there are patterns emerging within particular populations with disease risks or genetically carried disease suscepti uh, um, susceptibilities. They can do show entries and service certificates, and they can record weights and milk records and other kind of production things. And they can do all of that on very simple, straightforward forms directly onto the internet. That then enables us, the breed societies, to carry on creating our flock and herd books, which we've been doing for the last 150 years, 
but also much more immediately to start to be able to feed back information to those farmers and the groups of people that are conserving or breeding those breeds. So reports for the marketing committee about how many Gloucester carcasses are there actually going to be ready for slaughter next year? How many black, five, black fleeces are there going to be coming off, first clip fleeces off this particular breed? All the different things that people might need to know in order to be able to start a marketing campaign, we have that information at our fingertips. It can be given to mem the annual members' meetings, the magazines and the newsletters. Inf information is power. Being able to give people information and feed things backwards and forwards is really important. It's also important, for, obviously, for designing breeding programs, but also for the monitoring of what's happening within those populations for the Rare Breed Survival Trust and for the Farm Animal Genetic Resources Committee, um, which is represented here today. So in terms of the Farm Animal Genetic Resources, that's a DEFRA, organ a DEFRA committee who is charged with monitoring what's happening in all our livestock breeding populations. Until two years ago, that was done in a once a decade census. So pieces of paper were sent to breed societies and they were asked questions, actually questions that were quite difficult for them to answer, like how many adult adults, uh, how many adult females there are there in the population, which they don't know the answer to. Um, and so the, the data was very, very shaky and, and not, very stable, not, not very useful in a lot of ways. Now we have a process in place where annually we check on all the breeds which are on the Rare Breed Survival Trust list, all the breeds which are in uh, running the grassroots system, and we're able to feed back electronically and pretty much automatically the number of breeders, the number of female and male registrations from which we can calculate the live population, the numbers of sires and dams working in the population, which is really important because you might have lots of animals, but if they're all half sibs, then that, that, that can create a problem. So we're able to, to give that information very easily. That can then be used to put into indices, taking into account all of those different variables in order to monitor what's happening across populations, within populations, uh, and across time. So this is the uh, biodiversity indicators for the, the horses that was published last year. We had the same sort of diagrammatic ways of looking at what's happening, and of course we can bore down into that information to see what's going on within these breeds. One of the things we're looking at is trends in age distribution. So this is a fairly healthy, it's, it's, these are Gloucester cattle, so they're a very rare cattle breed. So the youngest animals are in column, they're one year old, through to the oldest cow who's 22 years old. And that's the kind of normal distribution that you'd expect to see. The numbers aren't that high, but it's you know, looking fairly, fairly comfortable. This is a breed which is screaming alarm bells. So this is an equine breed. So the, so the column one, as there's only um, a dozen <coughs> yearlings last year, uh, and the majority of the population is now over 12 years old. So this is a breed where we're in serious difficulty. And in fact, if you also then bore down in more detail into these younger animals, you'll find that they're all closely related, there are very few stallions being used, and the population is, is you know, collapsing. Um, so this, this kind of analysis and it really bangs it home to us that something needs to be done, and it needs to be done quickly. And there'll be other people talking later about what's, what's being done, Tom. <laughs> we can also look at geographical distribution. So this is a population which is very well distributed throughout the country. So if there was a disease outbreak or something was to go wrong in one area of the country, that's fine. This is a population that we have no worries about at all. But other breeds are geographically isolated and do, are therefore at geographical risk. So this is Gloucester cattle, which is a, a breed which I've, my family have bred all my life um, and of which I'm very, very fond. And it is from Gloucestershire originally. And you'll see that the majority of the population is still in Gloucestershire. Now that's a worry for several reasons. Obviously a foot and out mouth outbreak in Gloucestershire and we could practically lose the breed overnight. But in fact, the other disease, big disease threat for this breed is TB. So bovine TB, which is spreading all over the country, but Gloucestershire is a real hotspot for bovine TB. And I think this breed, more than any other, has been seriously affected um, by, that, by that disease over the last 20 years. And it's hanging on by its fingernails. Um, but but, but you know, that, that geographical concentration 
is causing us additional problems. The other sort of thing we can look at is what's happening within the, 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 the flocks and herds of individual breeds. So in this, in this slide, we can see that the, top, the two little tiny slices at the top are the people who have more than 100 cows or between 50 and 100 cows, so really big herds. Um, and that's only 7% of the membership. So on a first glance, you'd think that's great. The population is very well distributed. There are only very few people who've got really big herds. There's lots of people with, with herds of, of um, 1 to 10, with these two big chunks on this side. That's, that's a good thing. Until you think about it the other way round, which shows us that those same 7% of the, of the human population owning this animal own 44% of all the cows in the herd, in the national herd. So suddenly you see that you've only got to have a very small number of people, and this is a breed that that 7% doesn't represent very many people, uh, you've only got to have those people go down with a serious disease or just go out of the breed or get into financial difficulty. And again, populations can crash really, really fast. So it's important not just to be looking at the numbers of animals, but how related they are to each other, who owns them, where they are, and all of that sort of thing can be gleaned from pedigree registries. So in terms of rare breed conservation, we're interested in the long-term survival of breeds. And that it hangs around three conflicting components which are in constant tension. So we want to maintain the breed type and the breed characteristics because that's what rare breed conservation on the face of it's all about. But we also want to create a commercially viable product because realistically, we're not looking at zoo animals. We want these populations to have a role. And in order to have a role, we have to have a commercial uh, a viable product. That doesn't mean necessarily that they have to com compete directly with the high production strains. It might be a different role, but they must have a role and it must be viable. And we want to maintain the existing genetic variation within the breed. So even when we found a role, we don't want the whole breed to go in that direction. We want to be able to maintain variation, at the very least in a semen database, a semen gene bank, but, but ideally walking around. So that, those are conflicting things which we're dealing with all the time. The great advantage we have is that rare breeds, as a general rule, are kept by, by people like Andrew Sheppey. So they're stubborn people who are determined to keep their breed, come hell or high water, for whatever their own reason. And very largely, the, the vast number of breeds that we have today are thanks to, to that kind of determination and doggedness that, that those people have. The other thing that we need to be very careful of, as I've already mentioned, is not getting too inbred, is keeping genetic variation within the population. And over the years, there have been lots of different ways of doing that. Um, so traditionally, in the days of printed herd books, before computerization, people used family names to try and identify different lines, different bloodlines within populations. Then we moved over to looking at founders, and increasingly now we look much more at inbreeding and, and kinship. So in terms of family names, this was particularly prevalent in the pig world. So in pigs, in, in pedigree pigs, traditionally, a boar is always named after its father, and a sow is always named after its mother. So you've got a Gerald boar, and he has a Gerald boar, and so on, and then you count at the end of each decade how many Geralds you've got left, and you think, that's marvellous, we've got all these different families, and we've kept, kept the breed going, and it's all fine. The problem, of course, is when you look at one of those pedigrees, in this case, this is a Jasper boar. So he's a Jasper, so was his father, so was his grandfather, so was his great-grandfather. Right back to the mists of time, they're all called, called Jasper. And so people would say, well, that's great, we've kept the Jasper line going. But obviously, if you look at that pedigree, you can see he's got more Geralds in his pedigree than he's got Jaspers, because actually, that we're only looking at the top line. So although it's, it's a way of thinking about keeping populations going, it actually isn't a very good way because you might well be losing a lot of information, a lot of genetic information over a long period. So once computers became available, people started looking at other ways of doing it, and they started looking at founders. So they said, okay, well, let's start with the really famous bulls in this breed, or 
all the animals that are at the beginning of our electronic database, and we'll see how many of those are left in the current live population. Which works, you can do that, but of course what you're looking at is how much of the pedigree is made up of those original ancestors, not how much of the genes are necessarily in those, in those uh, ancestors. Doesn't tell us the probability of those genetic um, contributions. And that's because, as we all know, every cell in a mammal's body has two complete sets of DNA. They're pulled apart in the ovary and the testes to produce the egg and <coughs> sperm. And then those bits of DNA either are passed to the next offspring or not, because it's this one that goes and not, not that one. So the chance at every generation that a single piece of DNA, a single gene, passes from its an this animal to its offspring is 50-50. It's 50-50 every single generation. And we all know if you flip a coin six times, the chances that you will flip a head every single time for six generations gets less and less and less. So the chances that uh, one particular gene will pass, one rare mutation will pass from one animal all the way down through five, six, seven, eight, twenty generations is 50-50 each generation. It's not that half the gene comes and you get less and less and less. It's 50-50, it's, it's either there or it's not. And that's something which we sometimes struggle to um, get some of our farmers to, to really understand. So it's all about probability. What is the probability that founder genes will pass from one generation through to the current day? The other thing we need to think carefully about in rare breed conservation is optimising the space that we've got and making sure that we're using the right numbers of animals. So in a static population, in a zoo population, like tigers, for example, we have to make sure that every single male and every single female passes some of their genetic material to the next generation. So it's not just a case that we've got 100 tigers. We want 100 tigers that are as, as not too closely related and not all siblings. So that's why tigers in zoos are all on the pill, because what we want is for each male and each female to reproduce themselves in the next generation, and then that's all, because there are only, in my example, 100 tiger places. We can't go on breeding more and more tigers in zoos. We can't afford to keep them all. In rare breeds, we're not quite so tight with that, because we can encourage a new person to get into our breed and start keeping rare breeds. And generally speaking, most of our rare breeds our expanding populations. So we don't have to be quite so strict. But the important thing to know is that, that that's to do with the effective population size. How many animals are effectively passing their genetic material on to the next generation? So in my tiger example, if we've got a population, a fixed population of 100 animals, if 50 are male and 50 are female, then the effective population size is 100. We're maximizing the space that we've got. If those 100 places are taken up by 95 females and only 5 males, which happens in that horse breed that we were looking at just now, then the effective population size is only 19, it's less than 20. So you can see if that's the case, then over 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 generations, if you've only got 20 animals actually contributing their genetic material generation on generation and they're more and more closely related to one another, there's going to come a time when that population is going to be so inbred that it's not going to be able to survive. So this is a slide that we often show to farmers to try and explain this. So the top line is the female population. This is a sheep breed. The bottom line is the, is the, ram, the number of rams in each generation, each year. Um, and the green line in the middle is the effective population size calculated using right formula. So a very simplified formula, but it just is a very good visual way of showing people what's going on. So in this breed, fantastic peak in females. There are loads of new peak females coming into the population in the, in the early 2000s. But actually, if you look at the green line, having almost no effect on the effective population size because the number of males hasn't gone up at all. So you need to keep that balance of both males and females within the population. So the golden rules of conservation that we are always telling our, our farmers is that they should be using as many males as po possible within the population, to not keep too many offspring from any one male, and to minimise inbreeding. And we help them to do that by, again, having at their fingertips the information that they need to see what's happening within their breed. So they can see 
which males have they got working within the population? And we give the advice, we, RBSP, give the advice that no one male should produce more than 5% of the offspring, which will make up the next generation. So that's obviously a different number in different populations. But you can see in, in this, this particular um, graph, there's one ram there that's obviously already uh, exceeded his expectations. And the chances are he will also have lots of sons in the population. So this is the starting point. Who have we got out there? Who's working? Who's underworking? What rams could we be bringing into the population? And then we start to look in more detail at which those animals are, how inbred they are, and how closely related they are to one another. So inbreeding, which we talk about a lot in, in um, livestock breeding, is a probability calculation. Like our coin to tossing exercise earlier, it cal calculates the probability that a gene will be inherited from a common an ancestor in an, in, an, in an inbred pedigree. So how likely is it that if you've got the same great-great-great-grandfather, that by your 50-50 tossing coin exercise, that that rare gene will have come down both sides of the pedigree and will be duplicated in the animal that we get to, except we're looking at the whole genome, not just one gene. So an inbred animal, by definition, is more likely to be homozygous, and an inbred po population will carry less genetic variation. So to maximise the long-term survival opportunities for a rare breed, we need to try and minimise inbreeding, especially when we're starting with very small populations to start with. Kinship is the what-if inbreeding co coefficient for any mating. So again, it's a probability calculation, and it's an indication of how closely related two animals are to each other, or how closely related one animal is to a group of animals. It's a relative figure, so an inbreeding coefficient is an absolute figure for that animal. Kinship is relative. It's always how closely related this animal is to this animal or this group of animals. So it, it, it varies according to which group of animals you're comparing it to. But we're able to do that. Again, all the grassroots breeds can do that. They can give that information to their farmers very easily. At Melton Mowbray, which is our big rare breed show and sale every year, we're there all day running off kinship reports for farmers so that they can see all the rams that are available here at the sale. These are the ones that are closely related to their ewes at home and they shouldn't really look at. These are the ones that aren't related at all and go, you know, go and have a look at those. This is only one piece of information. This is just about how closely related they are. You've still got to go and look at the animal. You've still got to check it's got a leg in each corner and it hasn't got an overshot jaw and it's got the breed characteristics you look, you're looking for and it's going to nick with your ewes when you get home. So it's just one piece of information. But it does mean that farmers don't get home, get the pedigree certificate for the ram they've just bought, and then think, oh, no, it's got the same grandfather as half my ewes. I can't use it. So it just gives them that, that extra piece of information. We also use kinship to identify outside line males. So going back to that, which rams have we, have we got in the population, we can then look at the ones that are underused and see how closely related they are to the rams that we used in the last generation, or to the other rams alive at the moment, or all the ewes in the population. I'm saying, I'm saying ewes and rams, they could each really be cattle or horses. The computers don't mind what species it is. Um, but it enables us to identify those males which are potentially, you could potentially be useful within the breeding population. And it's also very useful when we're setting about creating a gene bank. Because again, it enables us to identify males, and indeed females, which are unrelated to one another or less related to one another. Because we know we want to have a gene bank of, say, 25 males, but they want to be unrelated. There's no point in having four half-brothers in the gene bank. You want them to be as unrelated as possible. And these tools enable us to do that at the press of a button. So pedigree registration then, from my point of view, is really important, not just for breed improvement, so that we can in, improve productivity and feed, feed a growing population of humans, but also for breed conservation, so that we can monitor genetic change within those populations, we can market our breeding stock and, and, and find roles for those breeds, and we can monitor and control disease. And I hope that those tools will continue to enable us to conserve the vast and wonderful array of breeds that we have here in the UK. Thank you very much. <laughs>